as where drugs are coming from. Argentina's Minister of Security, Patricia Bullrich announced in Washington that the Mauricio Macri administration is going to allow the U.S. to build a military base in Posadas, Misiones, bordering Brazil and Paraguay. Bullrich says her government is creating an analysis center with Paraguay, Brazil and U.S. to figure out where, how and with whom narco-traffickers operate at the triple border region. This task force, as it's being called, will operate in conjunction with the DEA, the Department of Homeland Security, and the U.S. Southern Command, which watches over U.S. operations in Latin America and the Caribbean. This will be the second task force against drug trafficking in Argentina. The first one was installed in Salta province located near the borders with Bolivia and Chile during the Barack Obama administration. Bullrich told the press that the DEA initially wanted Argentine officials to send drug samples to the U.S. so the agency could analyze them for their origin. She said this would be against Argentine law and that officials within the country would analyze the drugs. The U.S. and Argentine functionaries also discussed the suspected presence of Lebanese Hezbollah, an organization the U.S. government considers a terrorist group, at the border shared by Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. It's important for our government to collaborate with the U.S. and that they collaborate with us. We're going to work together at the triple border regarding terrorism. We think we'll have DEA and other agencies there to better understand what's happening in the region," Bullrich assured the press. The Minister of Security also met with Federal Bureau of Investigation and the Department of Homeland Security officials in Washington to discuss their training of Argentine Federal Police. After leaving Washington Bullrich flew to Miami to meet with the Chief of U.S. Southern Command, Admiral Kerr W. Tidd and the Defense Minister of Argentina, Oscar Aguad. Admiral Tidd was recently in Colombia meeting with its military forces. Human rights organizations are protesting the increased U.S. military presence in Latin America and the Caribbean. The former Argentine ambassador to Venezuela and the United Kingdom, Alicia Castro, tweeted of Bullrich's proposed policies, Do you want to see how the U.S. combats terrorism? Look at the Middle East devastated. And combating narco-trafficking? Look at the cartels and assassinations in Colombia e Mexico, the places where the DEA intervenes. For such a small, initially impoverished country, Israel did not have any security guarantees with larger, more powerful states, particularly the United States. The country was on its own, even buying conventional weapons off the black market to arm the new Israeli defense forces. Nuclear weapons would be the ultimate form of insurance for a people that had suffered persecution but now had the means to control their own destiny. Ben Gurion instructed his science advisor, Ernst David Bergman to direct Israel's clandestine nuclear effort and set up and chair the Israel Atomic Energy Commission. Shimon Peres, who later went on to serve as President and Prime Minister of Israel, cultivated contacts with a sympathetic France that resulted in the latter agreeing to supply large, heavy water nuclear reactor and an underground plutonium reprocessing plant, which would turn spent reactor fuel into the key ingredient for nuclear weapons. The reactor was built at Dimona in the Negev Desert. By the late 1960s the United States assessed Israeli nukes as probable, and U.S. efforts to slow the nuclear program and get Israel to join the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty went nowhere. Finally in September 1969, Nixon and Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir reportedly reached a secret agreement that the United States would cease its demand for inspections and Israeli compliance with anti-proliferation efforts, and in return Israel would not declare or test its nuclear weapons. Not much is known about early Israeli weapons particularly their yield and the size of the stockpile. The strategic situation, in which Israel was outnumbered in conventional weapons but had no nuclear adversaries, meant Israel likely had smaller tactical nuclear weapons to destroy masses of attacking Arab tanks, military bases and military airfields. Still, the relatively short ranges between Israel and its neighbors meant that the Jericho missile, with only a 300-mile range, could still hit Cairo and Damascus from the Negev desert. Israel does not confirm nor deny having nuclear weapons. 
Experts generally assess the country as currently having approximately 80 nuclear weapons, fewer than countries such as France, China and the United Kingdom, but still a sizable number considering its adversaries have none. These weapons are spread out among Israel's version of a nuclear triad of land, air and sea-based forces scattered in a way that they deter surprise nuclear attack. Israel's first nuclear weapons were likely gravity bombs delivered by fighter aircraft. The F-4 Phantom is thought to be the first delivery system, as a large, twin-engine robust fighter, the Phantom was probably the first aircraft in the Israeli Air Force capable of carrying a first-generation nuclear device. A new, smaller generation of nuclear gravity bombs likely equips F-15I and F-16I fighters. While some might argue a gravity bomb is obsolete in light of Israeli advances in missile technology, a manned aircraft allows a nuclear strike to be recalled right up to the last minute. Israel's first land-based nuclear weapons were based on Jericho I missiles developed in cooperation with France. Jericho I is believed to have been retired, replaced by Jericho II and three ballistic missiles. Jericho II has a range of 932 miles, while Jericho III, designed to hold Iran and other distant states at risk, has a range of at least 3,106 miles. The total number of Israeli ballistic missiles is unknown, but estimated by experts to number at least two dozen. Like other nuclear-armed nations, the Israeli Navy has reportedly deployed nukes to what is generally agreed to as the most survivable seagoing platform, submarines. Israel has five German-built and incline, traverse a 40% slope, and ford 2.5 feet of water without a snorkel, or 5 feet with a snorkel. Those requirements dictated a lot of the engineering and design choices AM General made in the Humvee. It was fitted with an independent suspension, its wheels were mounted on portal axles providing gear reduction and boosting ground clearance to 16 inches. The Humvee's entire drivetrain and even its brakes were sucked up into the body of the vehicle, making the cabin a tight squeeze but ensuring that the Humvee's off-road ability would meet military requirements. The whole package was rounded out with a full-time four-wheel drive system with a two-speed transfer case, locking differentials and a central tire inflation system. Although much of the military's requirements for the JLTV are still classified, it did want the 14,000-pound JLTV to go everywhere the Humvee could go but be faster and with more capability. To that end, Oshkosh fits each JLTV with its tac 4 i suspension system. A fully independent double wishbone design with electronically adjustable high-pressure gas shocks, Oshkosh tuned the JLTV's TAC-4i suspension in the Baja 1000, giving this military off-roader some serious Ford F-150 Raptor rivaling chops. The JLTV suspension has 20 inches of wheel travel and the ability to raise and lower the suspension as needed, negating the need for portal axles. Without the optional snorkel kit, and with its suspension in its highest setting, the JLTV can ford 5 feet of water without breaking a sweat. Like the Humvee, the JLTV also has a full-time four-wheel drive system with low range, locking differentials, and uptis. Although Humvees were initially pretty reliable in the field, as they aged and as the military upgraded them with heavy armor that increased wear and tear, they became garage queens to many servicemen and women. During the testing phase of the JLTV program, the U.S. Army and Marine Corps brought along 22 up-armored Humvees to test alongside Oshkosh, Lockheed Martin, and AM General's JLTV entrance, with each manufacturer providing 22 test vehicles. During nearly three years of testing, platoons equipped with Oshkosh JLTVs had the highest levels of mission success. Oshkosh's JLTVs were also far and away the most reliable of the bunch averaging 7,051 miles between operational mission failure, defined as a system failure that prevents the vehicle from accomplishing its mission. Up-armored Humvees were surprisingly the second most reliable of the group, averaging 2,968 miles between failures, followed by the Lockheed Martin JLTV at 1,271 miles between failures, and the AM General BRVO JLTV which averaged 526 miles between failures. Humvees offered up far better protection to its occupants compared to the open-air jeeps they replaced. In the same way that AM General improved the light tactical vehicle by adding a roof and doors, Oshkosh does the same by baking a base level of armor into each JLTV. Utilizing lessons learned on its MATV MRAP, 
Mine Resistant Ambush Protected Vehicle Program. The automated AGS can fire 10 rocket assisted, precision guided projectiles per minute at targets over 100 miles away. Those projectiles use GPS and inertial guidance to improve the gun's accuracy to a 50 meter, 164 feet, circle of probable error, meaning that half of its GPS guided shells will fall within that distance from the target. The projectile responsible for that accuracy, Something far too complex to just be called a shell or bullet is the long range land attack projectile. Each projectile has precision guidance provided by internal global positioning and inertial sensors, and bursts of relapse could in theory be fired over a minute following different ballistic trajectories that cause them to land all at the same time. Lockheed Martin won the competition to produce the relapse, and the company described their capabilities thusly, 155mm relap provides single strike lethality against a wide range of targets, with three times the lethality of traditional 5-inch naval ballistic rounds, and because it is guided, fewer rounds can produce similar or more lethal effects at less cost. Relap has the capability to guide multiple rounds launched from the same same gun to strike single or multiple targets simultaneously, maximizing lethal effects. The less cost part, however, turned out to be a pipe dream. With the reduction of the Zumwalt class to a total of three ships, the corresponding reduction in requirements for lap production raised the production costs just as the price of the ships they would be deployed to soared. Defense News reports that the Navy is cancelling production of the lap because of in dollar 800 comma per shot price tag, more than 10 times the original projected cost. By comparison, the nuclear-capable Tomahawk cruise missile costs approximately $1 million per shot, while the M700 and 12 copperhead laser that you're going to die, and the key to success is telling yourself, you can do it. That's what Barker, who runs a popular blog by the same name as the book, is saying. He writes that, after 9-11, the military needed more SEALs, but for obvious reasons, didn't want to lower their standards. Ultimately, they developed a mental toughness program in which Bud, S, basic underwater demolition, SEAL training, Candidates learn to develop essential skills, including positive self-talk. In fact, Barker writes, when the Navy started teaching candidates to use positive self-talk, in conjunction with the other skills, but, S passing rates improved almost 10%. The History Channel documentary The Brain, you can watch a clip here, explores how positive self-talk can help, but, S candidates' chances of success. According to the documentary, the average person says between 300 and 1000 words to themselves every single minute. If these words are positive instead of negative, they help override the fear signal coming from a part of the brain called the amygdala. The amygdala kicks into gear during threatening situations like pool comp, the underwater exercise described above. Barker gives examples of negative self-talk, I'm just not cut out for this or I've never been any good at these things, and of positive self-talk, I just need to keep working at it or I just need better tips on form. If the second set of thoughts becomes your default, Barker says, you're more likely to succeed at whatever you're trying to accomplish. Note that you're not telling yourself, everything